are muted. So, continuation, if uh, I'm on. Yes. So, you see, there are a lot of there are a lot of potentials. Uh, this potential include gas-based industries, as I said, power plants, pipe mills, uh, um, gas player commercialization, which I said. When you look at the downstream of the gas, you see that a lot of opportunities, integrated LPG businesses, pipeline infrastructure, city gate reception, as well as virtual pipeline solution and gas storage. The three critical gas pipeline the, o, the OB3, OBA for Obricon, Oben, the ELFS, that is Scrabos Lagos Pipeline, and the Ajakuta Kaduna Kanu. Along the line, there are a lot of potential to, to put city gates where you can put gas hub or from there you distribute. So we believe uh, it, it will now be a world of opportunity for, 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 for us. So, over. Okay. So, uh, so what is the DPR strategy? The DPR strategy is uh, for gas expansion and penetration, is to really have uh, security of supply, which ensures availability, security, and, and also enhanced domestic supply, especially from Nigeria LNG, from, uh, uh, from uh, Escrabos, from uh, Boni River Terminal, from also, we are trying to increase the, the, the liquid, that is the, 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 the mix. Currently, we have 80 20, profen 20, buten 80. So, we want to increase the mix to 40 60 based on our, 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 our ambience and, and the rest. So, that is, is very, very uh, key. And also, service instrument. This service instrument is our, is our business automation. If you look at it, all our, our, our business, our, our service instrument permit, approvals, uh, uh, and licenses, they are automated. Improve system and process toward issuance of all these service instruments. Then we have a program, we call it uh, GBIFS, Gas Business Incentive and Support Program, where we now push, you know, and get uh, CBN made a provision of 250 billion naira for anybody who want to go into gas to really get through the participating commercial uh, bank to get one single digit interest uh, loan to really go that. We push for that. And we get the technology. We, there's a special unit in DPR we create, we call it technology adaptation, whereby we review the technology, we confirm that it's safe and best practicable, applicable, and we approve. And above all, safety management. And for stakeholders, this stakeholder management, get the marketers, talk to them, public enlightenment, and above all, we introduce what we call MISDO. This MISDO is minimum industry safety training for downstream operators. That we believe will help in, 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 in achieving uh, the desired. The, 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 the thing is that as you expand gas, there are a lot of issues. Issue of safety is there. Issue of compliance is there. So for you to really have profitable gas business to expand it, the risk is on one hand, profit is another hand. So there has to be safety plus compliance. People are over zealous. You get somebody with approval to construct, but he will go ahead, construct without it being approved to operate. It's a big problem. Or you have somebody to establish, he doesn't have approval to construct, he go ahead to construct. That is a problem. So that is something that uh, is, 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 is a challenge while you are trying to decimate this uh, potential to people. Then, energy transition, preparing for the future. You know, initially, I started with a slide that is very similar to this. So for us to transit, to the future, there's, for fossil fuel, definitely there's investment appetite. You have to create it. 
And this, to create that, there has to be a reserve replacement. Now we are facing more difficult oil. It's no longer easy. You have to drill deeper and you have to find it in the frontier. You have to uh, go, a lot of fields are declining and there has co uh, the, the, the high cost of de decarbonization. Then on one hand, you need to get energy efficiency. So there's also investment appetite on that hand, whereby capital shift away from the uh, traditional energy to renewables. Returns drop as market fundamentals weaken. I can appreciate what other countries do to be a net exporter like US or to be this. Why that happened? Because of what we call spare capacity. And why that happened? Because of the internal utilization. You only give what you have. Currently, we are not energy sufficient. We are not energy secured. We don't have enough gas to power electricity. We don't have enough fuel to power all the vehicles. A lot of houses, only 20% have uh, energy. Whether it is renewable or not renewable, we should not be beclouded by this. The same energy is used by developed countries to develop themselves. And now they are telling us to drop it. We shouldn't use it. We should use something that they are trying to use. I think it's unfair for Africa and Africans to really go ahead with that because we've seen what is happening in India, China, Brazil. And while we are going for green energy, the brown energy is essential for us to take up there. So uh, we have to now, the onslaught of renewables is, is there and uh, the green publicity is changing attitudes of energy option. But reality is our option is to really use what we have to get what we want. So, and uh, with this, with this, I can say that, uh, I can say that uh, we, as we are preparing for the energy transition, the, the balance between environment and development, we need to look at it. Africa must develop its own resources in sustainable and responsible manner. And we, Africa, we cannot remain silent. We cannot be silenced with the resource we have. We cannot be export-based. Let's be seen and see how we can unlock and de-risk our own potential. Key in to, to, to mitigate impact. Early development of oil and gas asset. That is what we are pushing now aggressively in, 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 in Nigeria. Aggressive exploitation and exploration and development of gas. In-country value addition that will create job, create market, get everything. Hybrid fueling harnessing the other potential of uh, biofuels, then extraction technology to drive down the cost. That is what we are pushing. Green publicity is winning, but the world still needs brown energy. So I say it and I will say it again, Africa must take advantage of the window of opportunity we have. The Paris Accord acceptability is growing, but at the same time, our economy is not growing. If we integrate and have one integrated African energy or African economy, then we need to be seen as how can we oil this economy of Africa? Out of $200 trillion of world economy, I think less than 5% reside in Africa. Why? Because we don't have energy to grow that economy. Why? And we are net exporters and we have to be seen as oil and gas industry, we know. This is an industry that is very resilient and demand for oil will remain at least for the next 50 years. We know by indices. So oil and gas will attract investment in foreseeable future. And this investment will only come when you open it up. We see when we create a retinue of NOCs, national oil companies, we see how the kind of the Seplats, the, the Walter Smith, the, 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 the ITOs, all these companies are Nigerians and they are now competing. Some are even quoted in the, in, the, in the world's biggest stock exchange market. And they are all Nigerians and we are proud of them. So, just to cap it, when you look at my last slide, you see, oh, to the last slide, you see a giant, an elephant. And when you see this elephant, when you look at Africa, you take it like a gun. You see Nigeria is like the trigger. And Nigerians, we Nigeria, we have vast human and natural resource. 
put it in a vantage position as Africa's largest economy. And Nigeria, our country, is positioned to potentially develop its oil and gas resource for the benefits of stakeholders. Who are the most stakeholders? Nigerians. Reforms in oil and gas sector is geared towards realizing government aspiration. And government's aspiration is not to grow, only not to grow 40 billion barrel or 230 trillion, is to create value for Nigerians. Whether we grow it, if we grow it to export, we grow it to utilize and really decimate it into each and every Nigerian. Then economic integration in Africa is sine qua non to regional development and security. I would like to quote Nelson Mandela. He's a true African. And what did he say about Nigeria? He said the world will not respect Africa until Nigeria earns that respect. The black people of the world need Nigeria to be great as a source of pride and confidence. This is what Nelson Mandela said about our country. So African development, just use the Africa as a gun, as a giant, as elephant, trigger it with Nigeria. Africa will develop and transition of energy is it. So our destiny is truly in our hand. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Director and Chief Executive of Department of Petroleum Resources, uh, Engineer Awalu Sarki, for your great presentation. Uh, each time I listen to you, um, I get a lot of things to think of, I think about, especially in regards to Nigeria. Uh, you, you are a strong advocate of uh, national building, writing a, a story, you, you repeat this in several we should, write, we should write our own story. We should not allow other people to tell, us, to tell our story. Um, and this, this is a very important, in fact, if, I, if one will not take anything at, uh, at home at all, uh, this, uh, this aspect has to be, uh, um, to be uh, carefully looked into. I will thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I will just go quickly through the highlights of some of the things you said that, uh, that caught my attention. You mentioned that oil and coal will continue to remain relevant in the global energy mix, which I think is true. Um, uh, you, you said also that um, the per capita use of gas in Nigeria is around 5.5 kilograms, uh, which, which is uh, basically low compared to other African countries, meaning that there's still opportunity for us to, uh, to increase our consumption of especially gas. Uh, and then you said that we should uh, turn away from the raw material mentality um, and then move on to um, use, uh, adding value to our raw materials. Um, I think which is something that uh, is really important. We need to look inward. Then you, you mentioned several again about writing our, our story, learning from the past. You, you, uh, you, one of your slides, you say learning from the past to create the future. Uh, of course, we should have to look at how far we have come and then where we are going and then uh, make, take steps to, to be able to uh, actualize our dreams. You say um, uh, why our oil uh, reserve is not uh, growing, stagnating. Uh, uh, obviously, gas reserve is growing, which, which is good. Of course, everyone seems to be saying that gas is a future. Um, and then the future that we, everyone is talking about, we are still relevant in the future because our gas reserve is growing. Um, you mentioned that uh, our position, our population, and our, and our location in, Afri in Sub Saharan Africa has placed us in a very strategic uh, position that we, uh, we should leverage on. You mentioned several potentials that we should leverage on. You say that we have we are the largest uh, hub, uh, LNG hub in Africa, and that is obvious as true. Uh, we need to expand that, leverage on that, supply energy to African countries. You said that um, we also need to, for us to leverage on our potentials, we need to have access uh, to the world. Uh, and you mentioned that one way is through the Gulf of Guinea. And, and then you, you, you mentioned also that um, what, 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 what DPR is trying to do is to um, uh, push the gas to the people, especially now that uh, we are talking about making uh, the year 2020 as a decade uh, for gas development. So the, the key strategy is to push the gas to people, 
uh, gas for power, auto gas. Um, and then you say that the main, the key strategy for G DPR to uh, leverage on these potentials that the country has is, is uh, what you call gas expansion and gas penetration. And uh, I, I think D DPR is doing a lot. Sometimes I, I, I do, uh, my, my thinking, I uh, ask this question is, DPR resting, is the director sleeping at all? A lot of things, everyone is mentioning DPR. Uh, we thank you, um, uh, we thank you so much for this presentation and for the insight you have given. Um, you, have, you really handled this uh, section as usual. I mean, you are always very uh, sound, brilliant information. Uh, key, you always provide data to back up your argument and this, this we really appreciate that. Um, we thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, keep sending your questions um, Why we move to the next presenter. Uh, next presenter. Uh, thank you again, uh, our CEO and the director of DPR, Engineer Awalu Sarki. Uh, uh, questions will come here. I think there are a lot of questions coming for you. Uh, so we'll come back to you. Uh, after the next presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to the next uh, presentation quickly. Sorry for the time. Um, we also want to apologize to uh, Professor uh, Onoha for the, some of the delay. I wanted to switch his um, profile back then. Uh, so we, I'm sorry about that. So ladies and gentlemen, before I, I read, uh, before Professor Onoha takes uh, the virtual stage, for his presentation. May I crave your indulgence to read his profile? Carlo Mostos, um, Carlo Mostos Onua is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Geology at the University of Nigeria in Suka, and the current president of the Nigerian Academy of Science. He also serves as a vice chancellor of scientific innovation of the African Scientific Research and Innovation Council, an agency of the African Union, AU, which was established in, 19, uh, in 2018. He had his university education at the Lawrence Esports University in Budapest, Hungary, uh, between 1971 and 1978, uh, where he majored in applied geophysics. He obtained uh, his PhD in 1978. He served as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Physics, Technical University of uh, Kloster Zellerfield, uh, Germany, before returning to Nigeria to take a, uh, up an appointment as a lecturer in the Department of Geology for the University of Nigeria and Suka in 1980. Rising through uh, the ranks in the university, most of Onoha was promoted to the position of a reader. Uh, which is associate professor in 1985, a full professor of geology in 1988. He served as head of the Department of Geology at the University of Nigeria uh, in Suka between 1987 and 1990, and was a pioneer mobile uh, professor of geology at Ezomobile, uh, chair of petroleum geology at the University of Calabar between 1991 and 1992. Um, on leave of absence from the university, he also served as a technology development advisor, subsurface development services at the Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited in Port Harcourt. That was uh, between 1996 and 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Onua has held many leadership positions at the universities of Nigeria and Suka, including Shell NNPC Professor of Geology, Shell Chia between 2001, 2012, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic 2005-2009 and Chairholder of the Petroleum Technology Development Funds, PTDF, uh, and Chair of Petroleum Geology between 2013 to 2017. He has, he has over the years successfully supervised many undergraduate and postgraduate students. A good number of, these, of his mentees today hold top positions in the oil and gas industry, and several are now serving as full professors in different universities within and outside Nigeria. Professor Noah is a fellow of the Nigerian Mining and Geoscience Society, a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Petroleum Explorationists, and a member of American Association of Petroleum Geologists. He is a major, uh, bridge, is a major bridge, bridge builder between the oil and gas industry and the academia, and has received many awards and honors 
uh, in his working life, some of which include Chief M.O. M. O. Fadai Medal of the Nigerian Mining and Geoscience Society in recognition of his excellent and consistent contribution to the field of petroleum geology in Africa. And the other one is the Dr. Nadia Zikwe Prize for consistency, uh, consistently, uh, consistently advise, advancing and promoting the study of geosciences. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mostol Onoha records of uh, professional activities, community services, services rendered to Nigeria and Africa over the years include Editor-in-Chief, Nigerian Journal of, of Mining and Geoscience, 1987-1993, member of the Auditorial Board of several reputable international scientific journal, including Journal of Africa Art Sciences, published by Estivia, member of the governing council of several Nigerian universities and vice visiting professor to several universities. His research activities over the years have, have been in exploration geophysics, technophysics, characterization of petroleum reservoirs, and the mitigation of natural and man-made hazards in the West Africa and Central Africa. He has published over 125 articles in leading peer-reviewed international and local scientific journals, book chapters, and he, he is a core editor of four books and the editor of two others. Uh, his most recent work is a, a, a 396-page book entitled Advances in, in Petroleum Geoscience Research in Nigeria, Reservoir Characterization and Basin Analysis Studies, which was published in July 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me at this juncture to invite Professor Onoha, Onoha to proceed with his presentation entitled An Overview of the Petroleum Potentials of the Inland Basins in the Northern Nigeria. Prof, you are welcome. The virtual stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's uh, a privilege to be able to talk to everybody at a time like this. And um, when you are speaking uh, last, and when it's so late in the day, I know there is uh, some element of weariness. And uh, all the same, um, we will go ahead and um, and uh, see what we can do. So um, I'll try to share my screen and um, I hope um, I hope you can see the screen. Yes, Prof, I can see your screen. All right, thank you very much. And um, I just want to appreciate the uh, SPE uh, Abuja chapter. You are doing a great thing. And uh, I also would like to thank those who spoke before me. My very good friend, uh, Professor Chidi Ibe, uh, who did justice. And the, the DPR <laughs> director, I'd like to thank you first for the passion, the way you speak, and of course, you have a wealth of knowledge. I'd also like to thank you for what you're doing since you took up the mantle of that organization. Um, I'm particularly glad about the National Data Repository of which uh, right from inception I was involved and sat on the board, on that Data Advisory Board for over 10 years. I'm glad you've revived it. And um, I know better things are coming and I can't agree with you better. And uh, a passing comment before I start on the topic that is, can Nigeria really be the energy hub? Of course, the answer is yes. As Professor Ibe said, it all depends whether we are ready. We have all the things. Just listening to the DPR director and what is covered upstream, downstream, and our potentials. There is no doubt that we can be the energy hub, and we should be without argument. Um, because time has gone a lot, and because I would like to make sure that we can discuss briefly, uh, let me just, they asked me, the young people asked me to talk about the petroleum potentials of the basins in northern part of the country. It came out of very many reasons because of all the things that have been happening lately, the discoveries. And uh, so I will just say a few things about these basins, the frontier basins. I'll talk about the little we know about them 
which means aggregating the geological and geophysical data, which is what we require. Of course, there are risks involved. And then I'll conclude. This map you've seen already a lot. Um, on the left, this is the Google Gravity map of, let's say, Nigeria. But we're interested in the sedimentary basins, which uh, this geological map is on the right. And uh, this is a very well-known figure, especially the geological map taken from uh, long ago. Now, the sedimentary basins again are here. You've seen the diagram before the Bennett trough. So these are the areas I'm speaking about the Chad Basin, if I call it Bono Basin, with the Gongola Arm, and then of course the Bida and the Sokoto Basins. I will not speak about the Anambra Basin and the other sedimentary basins, like uh, even though we have data on them and their petroleum potentials are also important. I'd just like to say that these are our inland basins, they constitute a set of a series of Cretaceous and later rift basins that are associated with the opening of uh, the Atlantic in the uh, uh, Mesozoic era, which is a uh, time in geological times. We'll be speaking particularly about the Sokoto Basin and the Chad Basin and this area, this area, this area, which is making news now, this Upper Bermuda Basin if you like to call it the Gongola. But there are also other areas that are quite interesting. And uh, so, but if you're going to find petroleum, because of the benefit of the young people that are on board, I like to remind us that we as explorationists, we are usually expected to answer four questions. There are four basic exploration questions that we like to answer. First, we like to tell you where to drink. In other words, our assignment is to look for whatever we're looking for. In this particular case, we're talking about oil and gas. So where is it? If I tell you where it is, I should give you an idea of the location. How deep down is it? So I should give you information about depth also, not just the location. That's the first question. I should also give you information about what to expect. In other words, in practical terms, the hydrocarbon volumes because that's going to have economic significance. And when people say that, oh, they found oil in my place, and then NMPC walked away, why will NMPC walk away? Why did, will the DPR not give approval? Because the other reason finding it is not just the, the volumes are important. So we as explorationists, we're also supposed to give you information about the volumes. Uh-huh. But that's not enough. I should be able to tell you, remember, Remember everything we do, we walk around the surface, no matter what, whether it's area, survey, there's a chance, there are, there are errors. So how certain? If I'm going to tell you I'm going to find petroleum three and a half uh, kilometers below the surface somewhere, should, there should be other chances, something about the chance of success, there should be risk involved. And then finally, the fourth question is, is uh, about the economics of the whole matter. How profitable is it? Oil and gas business is big business, expensive business, costs money. If there's not going to be any poly, uh, profit, then we're not going to go there. So quickly, we'd like to answer a few questions. How come we are talking about Gongola Basin now? How come we are talking about Bida Basin now? What were we doing before all this time? So why have Nigeria's inland basins remained largely unexplored for many years. I can give a whole lecture on this, but let me briefly just answer that. Well, first of all, the geology of those areas were poorly known. Another reason, oil was coming easily, freely, well, no, not free, relatively easily in terms of technology and so on from the Niger Delta. Next, also, oil and gas Primarily, even today, as the director of DPR has said, has reminded us, it's an export commodity, although we are trying to increase our internal consumption. Export means you have to take it away from somewhere. Why will you go to somewhere very far away to go and look for what you bring 
if I found oil near Chad Basin, then it has to go through Pony or even Lagos or wherever. So nobody was interested. So the logistics, even when NMPC knew or suspected that we could find something, and we we're spending money in the chat, which some people thought was unnecessary. No, but I show you part of the reason. Well, also, there are logistic areas. Well, where we, well, will you use it? Our internal, our ability internally to use oil and gas very, has remained very uh, dismal. So these are some of the reasons. So another question that one may ask, okay, now, what are the reasons behind this renewed interest today? Why are we just here? Of course, why not? Why not? First of all, as uh, Chidi said, Prof. Sibbe said, we need to uh, 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 expand our areas. There is derivation in revenue and uh, we get a certain percentage. So if I have something in, my, in a basin in my own area, in Southern Sokoto Basin, why will I not maximize it? And of course, there were all the militancy and all the other problems, but even for a nation, we don't have to put our bas eggs in one basket. So it makes common sense. Plus the fact that all around us, in Chad, in Niger, in Sudan, in these same areas that I showed you, the geological fractures and so on, they were finding oil. And even Chad had to build a 1,072 kilometer pipeline from Chad to Kribi at the coast in Cameroon, financed by the World Bank. If you have to do all that, then they're not wasting their time, so why not? So, then how DPR director is still here. So good, I'll show you some slides of how, how we performed in previous bid rounds, especially with bid rounds around the corner. So I'll give you some of these slides, so some of the reasons why. A, a slide borrowed from DPR, which you have seen earlier, this, the basins are clearly shown, and the oil blocks marked. Now, this is an interesting story I like to tell. The last bid round was in 2005. And there were 16 blocks in this area. Of course, nobody, 13 carved out in Chad, nine in the Anambra Basin, 25 in Niger Delta, and so on. What was the performance at the end of that exercise? Well, the exercise, there were 77 blocks open, thrown open, and at the end, this is what happened. The performance. Everything in Niger Delta was taken and deep offshore. Yeah, the award performance is in green. So you can see 56% in Anambra, Benue only 13, Chad 31, 100% in the onshore, offshore, and, and near shore, and all that. So why? Because and that is the perceived profitability because of the amount of geological information we know. So, our business now, the northern part of the country. Well, first of all, before you can have hydrocarbon anywhere, there are some basic conditions that must be met. There must be organic matter in the source rocks, so you look for them first, the source rocks. Then the sediment history and environment of the position of the sedimentary layers are important. Then the, the way the sediments in the basin evolve, their temperature regimes, and the way they've subsided, there's uh, information about hydrocarbon generation ability and even the retention ability. There must be reservoirs, there must be seals. Everything must be in place, including the time of creation of the structures in place to allow for hydrocarbon accumulation. If hydrocarbon forms somewhere and migrates and where it should store, it should be stored, it's not there, it will just go. So everything has to fall and be in place. So, a small cartoon that you may have seen somewhere that summarizes what I'm saying. We call them the petroleum system elements, the thing that have to be in place. Permit me now to quickly rush through what we know about some of the basin. This is a geological map of the Sokoto Basin. And so we know. And the basic stratigraphy, if I go back to that, the uh, Sokoto group, the Rema group, which environment is continental, which is marine, which is brackish. So these are the things, they are ages, not so important for now, uh, for people, the, the, the name of the formation. So these are the things we look for and try to find out which area will be more profitable. 
I like just to summarize that for Sokoto Basin, based on geology and geophysical work, a lot of surface geological work has been done. A lot of uh, aeromagnetic data now available. We are looking for the deeper parts of the basin, and we have found them. Before initially, if you read if you read books that tell you something about the Sokoto Basin, in those days you see something like ah that area there'll be nothing because the deep sediment thickness is hardly up to 500 or 700 meters above basement. So no, but that's not true. Thanks for te to technology, we now know a lot, a lot better. And uh, NMPC, which has done a lot of work, summarizing this, we've mapped clearly identified areas. If you look at this, which is residual magnetic anomaly map, the blue, the more the blue, the more the deeper part. So the southern Sokoto Basin, we think we can have sediments in excess of 2,500 meters. That should be good enough. The northern part, not so much. And parts of the Bida Basin too. And uh, what you are seeing now, NNPC's proposed uh, 2D lines that we hope will now give us more information. I don't want to go too much into geology and formations but uh, uh, we need more information on source rocks. We do have some. Our colleagues have been doing a lot of work in that area. The reservoir rocks, we know, and we, we've identified the potential reservoir rock. Remember I told you those things that have to be there. So we think uh, uh, some sands, the formation we call the Guandu, uh, they should have good porosity and uh, also, some structure, faulting, the things that will create the traps, although no faulting is reported. Let me just try to summarize what we know around the Sokoto Basin. Uh, we think we, there may be potential for stratigraphic trapping. And uh, the important thing is that key elements of the petroleum system are available. We found them in the basin. What we need now is more detailed geological and geophysical studies to be carried out. I know that the NNPC is planning seismic, some regional 2D lines. I don't know what stage that's in. After that, a few deep wells should be drilled to obtain data from deeper levels. Then there'll be more analysis, just as was the case for Chad Basin. We had a tumor one, uh, I'll go to Chad soon, but it took the drilling of the first 23 wells in Chad. And then there was a moratorium on drilling, detailed studies, mapping out the better different parts of the basin that we should now concentrate. Same thing will happen here. We'll, uh, Frontier uh, Department of the uh, NMP has, uh, NNPC has been doing good work, and seismic is the way to go. Bida Basin, that's where the action now is. And uh, I know that, uh, again, a basin that was completely ignored for long. We only had geophysical data, aerial data, gravity, magnetics. The basin itself is about 350 kilometers long in the north, west, southeast trending, almost at perpendicular to the Benway Trough. Source rocks, reservoir seals have all been found. We think they are there. I must confess that some of my colleagues, especially at Lapai, Prime uh, Babangida University, have been doing excellent work. Uh, Professor Nubabaje, uh, leader, and um, they've done a lot. What we require now is data from deep. You know, that was seismic, and I'm glad to know that uh, NMPC also uh, is planning up to 600 kilometers of 2D land. I think the acquisition probably has started. And, but as for what, which ones will be trapped, some of those things have been identified. I showed you this earlier. It's just to confirm that its acquisition of 2D lines will be used now. So NMPC is carrying on with that. They've done a lot of uh, geochemistry data, ground magnetic, stress, radiometry, all these have been done. And they have been used now to map out portions of the basin where will, uh, this seismic will be done. And then this seismic will now give us the areas where uh, the wells, uh, wells can be done. Middle and upper Benue, well, 
Gongola Basin. I, I remember way back in 2006, I was a, a guest lecturer at uh, Sir Kashim Ibrahim Memorial Lecture. It used to be a series put together by the Nigerian Academy of Science and the Bornu Forum, Bornu Elders Forum. So they had that. Sir Kashim Ibrahim was the first governor general of Northern Nigeria. And uh, in that lecture, and that was shortly after the 2005 bid. And, um, and of course, the uh, blocks, which you see now. These areas, some of us had, I remember in that time, telling people, yes, the Gongola arm of the Upper Benue was where to go, for, even before more emphasis on the child basin and the blocks. And I'm glad that the work that has been done today by NMPC and the Kolmani River one at that time had been done, and now the wells that have uh, shown uh, what lies in this area. We had known, we had known that uh, possible source rocks uh, from geochemistry data, all the people Prosipe mentioned who did preliminary work, was all the work being done at ADPU, Bauchi, and the colleagues there, a lot of information that until you test with the trap. And I'm glad right now with Komani River 2, finding oil, and uh, with about 440, uh, 440 square kilometers of 3D seismic acquired by NMPC. We can't talk about those data now, but um, I know that uh, I expect business to exploration business, drilling business, all other things permitting that disturb us right now in this country. Uh, this area should see some activity soon. So all the petroleum system elements we've been identifying uh, are getting better known. And the OPLs, I even ventured to name OPLs in those days. This is taken from an old presentation of mine. Uh, uh, that uh, I don't know whether DPR has renamed the OPLs. I use the old names where I ventured to advise them that those were the areas to concentrate. So we are good and on in, in this area now. Let me quickly touch on the chart basin so that we can, because of time, uh, we can discuss. Uh, exploration activities started right from around 1977. In the first phase, NMPC acquired over 2,300 kilometers of 2D lines. Eventually, about 23 wells were drilled, beginning from Tuma 1, the first that was spotted with fanfare. I remember that time David Wells was Minister of Petroleum when Tuma 1 was drilled. And uh, eventually, there was a moratorium so that we could study. All that, Tuma 1 was dry, of course, and only two wells, YD 1 and Kenasa 1, should some presence of gas. And so now, after the moratorium enabled us to know the parts of the uh, basin now that are more prospective, the rest, you know, I don't want to, a lot of studies now have been done in the Chad Basin. We know the structure. We, oil has been found as announced by the NNPC itself. Drilling has areas of interest have been identified closer to the, the lake itself. Of course, you know all the problems in that area now. So, and even our colleagues, some uh, from University of Medellin were captured and NMPC. So I, I, we don't need to be told that not much is going on there, but we expect as soon as peace returns, that work will go back there. Uh, we pay tribute to the earlier workers, Peters and Equals, and all the people who from geochemical work uh, actually attracted interest in these areas. We had known that even possible trap mechanisms had been identified. And today, a lot of work has been done on correlation. We know the uh, prospective place, and we know a lot better about the chart business. So let me just quickly try to round up on the chart. We have identified two petroleum system plays. A lower and 
Cretaceous place, just summarizing what I can regard as known now. Some bit of invasion delays, remember this, that has a dual effect. While it, the excess increase heat might increase maturity, but it also destroys or degrades uh, hydrocarbon formed. We also know now that the bagger towards the leg charge area, which are the areas where an NPC found something, uh, where further work should be concentrated. I think this is my last slide. Yeah, it's my last slide. So what we need to do in these basins in the north is that we need to increase geological and geophysical studies, especially keep evaluating the petroleum systems in those areas. We have found commercial oil now, even in the Gongola Arm and in parts of the Chad Basin, just as our neighbors found earlier. So there is great possibility now for adding to our reserves from the inland basins. It's now more real than ever before. That is going to be gas more. It shouldn't be a problem because gas is a, a for the future, as they tell us. And there's a lot of potential for internal consumption of gas, as the DPR director himself was saying, if we do the right things. And I look forward to also a time where we do not have to pipe uh, crude for refining over long distances, subject to all the problems we're having. Now, let's say the Kaduna refinery can supply them from nearby places. And that's certainly going to happen if we can work a lot more, invest a lot more in these inland basins like Bida, southern part of Sokoto Basin, the Gongola Basin, even the Yola Arm of the Benue Trough and the other parts of the Benue, especially if I use states now, Nasarawa state side and Benue. Because we know, because of the a host and gravel structure that's block for there, there are drops in the Benue. There are places in excess of six kilometers of sediments in parts of the Benue Trough covered by sediment. We haven't tested them in the middle. And even in the Yola arm of the trough, we have three, three kilometers of sediment. So I know there is a lot of uh, prospect for finding a lot more oil. And it's just, um, and we need to do it. The majors, as my colleague was earlier saying, are not going to do it. We are the ones that will prove uh, the prospectivity which is what NNPC have been struggling to do. They need to be encouraged some more. And then hopefully even international and other bigger companies can now um, come up. I'd like to thank you for listening um, so, so that we can quickly discuss. I know we've uh, taken much longer than everybody expected, even those of us that are speaking. We didn't know we'll still be around on the program by now. Thank you for listening to me. Let me stop sharing my slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Over to you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor, for this sharp presentation. It was quite fast and on time. Um, <clears throat> I mean, geology is a little bit uh, strange, but uh, we learn a lot from what you said, uh, especially uh, for the fact that's why that I didn't want to bother you with too many things. <laughs> uh, uh, for the fact that there is hope uh, to, I mean, add to our reserves. And I love the point you mentioned about gas. We uh, it looks like we're going to have more gas, uh, which is which is the future. Uh, again, tying back to uh, the theme of this uh, event, which is Nigeria as the energy hub of Africa, assessing feasibility in the next 50 years. Uh, it means that even beyond the next 50 years, we may still be the hub uh, of energy in Africa, uh, given that uh, most of the reserves are yet um, discovered yet. So thank you so much, uh, Prof, for, for your presentation, uh, which you title to an overview of the petroleum potentials of the inland basin in Nigeria, in the, in the northern part of Nigeria. Thank you so much. Uh, also, one other point, which I think uh, probably maybe DPI or NNPC or government will look 
to promote is how to increase the, the interest of, of um, the investing public uh, in this business. Because you mentioned that in 2005, uh, the bid round was not very uh, promising for the northern uh, part of Nigeria. Uh, most of the, the available blocks in the Niger data were all taken. Uh, but then when you look at the northern part of the country, uh, people still look at it as risky. Uh, so maybe we need to do something to encourage that. But, uh, no, it was then, because of the perceived uh, risk. The perceived <laughs> risk at that, <laughs> at that time. It has changed, man. Yeah, yeah. Perceived so risk. what will happen now? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for the work you're you doing. Um, thank you so much. I think the questions are coming in as they come. We're going to throw at you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. And I would still like to crave your indulgence to send your questions to the, um, to the question and answer section uh, in the webinar. Uh, we are going to read your questions to uh, the, our distinguished speakers uh, for their response. Uh, this time, this, uh, we have now reached uh, another milestone in this uh, presentation. Uh, we are going to be taking questions uh, now. Um, there are some, a few questions here uh, for Professor Iber. I will start with Professor Iber. Um, regarding, someone asks, regarding the high cost of production of Nigeria's oil compared to other countries, is it not our relative, relatively high and sometimes perhaps needless operation cost, especially security, one of, one of the factors which may make the NNPC GMD uh, $10, $10 per barrel oil production cost not possible. What about the perceived notorious cost of corruption in our business sphere compared to other countries? Uh, I don't know if I, if I was too fast, Professor Ibe, are you there, Prof? Uh, Prof, I, you may want yes, to unmute I've, yourself, Prof. I've, yes. I've, I've, um, I've unmuted my microphone now. Yeah, okay, good, Prof. Yes. Yeah, so you want me to answer that question? Yes, I think the questions are a bit long. Maybe uh, there are actually two questions here for you. Um, Maybe this one is long. It looks like it's long. It has to be like three questions in the body. So you may want to answer that one. Then, then I, will, I will read the second one for you to answer. Okay. Um, yeah, I discussed these um, issues of uh, cost. Um, the, the usual reason given for the high cost is the terrain, you know. Uh, but for me, as both a geologist and an engineer, I know that that doesn't hold uh, water. If you're talking about um, the swamp environment, our swamp environment is, um, is easy to assess. Um, and it's only, access is only a very small part. Um, the next issue thrown in there, uh, in terms of argument for the high cost, is security. Now, the oil companies pay very little for security. The security of uh, oil fields and installations are assured by the federal government of, the Niger I mean of Nigeria. The companies pay very token. I have in my class at the um, Nigerian Defense Academy, you know, the commander of the brigade of um, guards. And when he showed me, when this came up as a class discussion, and he showed me the contribution of the oil companies, they're actually riding on the backs of, um, of, um, of Nigeria. And for good reason, is the, is the um, responsibility of uh, the state to provide security for goods and um, <laughs> citizens. So that much vaunted reason for the high cost just does not hold water. And talking about um, the, um, the environment, nobody is arguing about the conditions which are very 
uh, uh, propitious in our own case. If you look at the Niger Delta, for instance, you literally scratch the ground and you find oil. For example, I, I was the petroleum engineer uh, that drilled the, the Bomu wells, Bomu 42, Bomu 46, Bomu 43, and the Imo River wells, you know, in the 70s, mid 70s. And literally, once you scratch the ground, you know, we're producing oil at 4,200 feet, 4,600 uh, uh, feet. Even if you go deeper, the average in the swamp and um, land environment, is, the statistics are there. It's about 5,000, just over 5,000 feet. Compare that to these other uh, countries that I've mentioned. Saudi Arabia in 2016 drilled a well to 32,464. I might not be exact, but over 32,000 feet. And everybody knows, any engineer knows, the deeper you go, the more material to you, the more difficult it becomes. The wells out there in the desert are much deeper and so costlier you know, in terms of um, operational uh, costs. So some of the arguments are a bit perverted and um, very worrying, but when you get down to the brass tacks, and I think a guy like um, Sheikh, um, 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 what was his name, the present GMD, who is a geologist, I think he must know these facts. And he must have taken them into account when he um, announced his objective of attaining $10 per barrel by 2021. And I think it's a very laudable thing and it's very much achievable. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, so um, I will follow up that. Um, I will allow you to rest. I'll now go to uh, the director and CEO of the Department of Petroleum Resources, Engineer. Uh, um, someone asks, I don't know if our director is there, uh, sir. Someone asks, considering, considering, Nigeria, considering Nigeria has a very high production cost per high petroleum production, what or how can the country possibly reduce production costs to a competitive level? This question goes to the DPR director. Is, is the, is the um, director there? If not, I can still chip in. Oh yes, um, chip in there, Prof. Yeah, I continue along the same lines that we do have all the advantages over these other areas that have achieved, you know, $10, $10 mark. You know, by the time you go to Qatar, Egypt, and all, all that over the Middle East, which I know very well, you know, um, you, you have between 10, 11, I think the highest is 13. And I have just told you that we do have comparative advantages. The cost, security costs that the oil companies make a lot of, they pay a pittance for the security. They lean on, the, on government resources, the mobile police, the army, uh, the civil defense, they're all paid by the state. And, and that's the way it should be. So I really wonder, you know, if they keep a few guards here and there, why the security issue should be a big issue. I think that's um, an item that, of expenditure that DPR should look at because I have seen very practical demonstration where they pay literally a pittance to the security assigned to them. In terms of geology, like I said, um, Gary, must know a lot of things as a geologist to know that we are producing oil much more easily than these parts they're using, we're using for comparison. For example, I know that in the Middle East, 
you do something equivalent to fracking in order to increase the permeability of the reservoirs to induce uh, uh, permeability. So that's expensive. In, in the Niger Delta, for instance, the oil, in fact, <laughs> almost like overflows, flows so easily that it brings in uh, uh, sand grains and clogs up the, um, <laughs> the, the, the production stand. So when, when I, I was a young petroleum engineer on site, we used to use epoxy resin. They use something else now, chemicals, to artificially consolidate because we had too much porosity and too much permeability. But they need to induce permeability, I mean porosity and permeability through processes akin, similar to fracking. So all those things should weigh against them in terms of high cost and for us in terms of lower cost. So we should aim. It's a very positive and very desirable uh, target to aim at. And um, I wish uh, Kerry all the best uh, in his um, determination to bring the oil. Because in this low cost, uh, low oil, oil um, price environment, you need to do that. If not, um, a lot of uh, profit that should have gone to the state in terms of taxes, bonuses, royalties, will be frittered away to so-called um, uh, production costs. When the oil price was 100 um, and above, people looked away. But now is the time to look in. And I'm sure Awalu and his DPR colleagues will take um, a deeper look at the expenditure sheet of the uh, uh, foreign operating um, companies. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shidibe, uh, for your response to the question. Uh, I have another question here. This question goes to uh, Professor uh, Onoha. Uh, the person is asking, what would your arguments be regarding foreseen oil and gas exploration in the north as opposed uh, to focusing on the regions, regions, other resources that are more accessible and less costly to explore? I don't know which other resource of the region. Every resource should be developed. Yes. Every resource, every resource should be developed. Um, for very many years, this nation was uh, uh, supported with, by mining. And most of the mining activities for which Nigeria was known, apart from coal from the Enugu area, and that was the only coal field developed in the entire West Africa, the Enugu coals, it was the tin columbide mining in the Just Plateau area and all the other associated, and a little of uh, lead zinc mining also in, in parts of eastern Nigeria then in those days. Now, um, what we need to do as a nation is to develop all our resources. And I think the government is very, very right today in what they are doing, trying to return to mining and lay emphasis on the development of solid minerals, because we still have them. But at the same time, we are just beginning to discover oil in parts of the North, and we must continue with that effort, because that is the only way. What we really need to do is what the director of DPR was saying, which is to create market internally for most of the goods, especially those we can consume by the oil and gas. And even the solid minerals, we must not be exporting raw minerals. We must be able to beneficiate them and send out what we can send as refined. That is not happening. Even what is being mined today, tin columbite, is supposed to be exported as tin metal and not raw tin ore. But I tell you, as those in Kano Airport through which most of these are sent, you know, is it all that is being exported to Liverpool? Where all the other accessories that we, shall get, we should gain from them because when you have an oil, they always have accessory minerals. For example, the lead zinc, you have uh, lead and zinc. We have uh, silver from there. And uh, we are giving it all out outside and selling to people. So in the summary, because of time, we need to develop every resource that we have, especially in the North, 
and we need to employ people. Let me tell you the number of people that used to be employed in the mining industry. They said 1992 paper that study that I did very widely read, very widely, it's still being circulated today, especially in planning departments on tin and columbite and what happened when we lost it. And the migration over 12,000 people that used to be working in mining, all going to look for a job at Abuja. Now we are talking about the ordinary people now, not highly educated, those who would have been the people working. So we need, and we have more people now, youth jobless. These are the people we need to find jobs, both in agriculture, in mining, and in the, of course, in oil and gas, if we can. I agree totally, Mr. Moderator, with the learned professor. It's not a question of either or. It's a question of all development of all our resources. Thank you, Prof, for that addition. Um, there's a question here for the DPR director. Um, it, I think it links to uh, what, what I think both of you professors are, always, are quite uh, familiar with. Uh, maybe you may want to give answer to this question. Uh, someone is asking, uh, are there efforts to exploit the oil sand? Uh, let me answer that because uh, at least for long now, my team is the team that has been doing, has done a, a lot of work on uh, shale gas I'm talking about. The others, like a colleague of ours, Professor Meke Ukwazo, has been working for long on in an area of that. Now the truth about shale gas, just to be brief, is that we have, we have these resources in Nigeria. And uh, whether we can develop that is another issue. There are challenges for the development. We are explorationists. We are only to explore. And my team, working at the University of Nigeria and Soka, we've done some work on the Anambra Basin, which is southern part of the Benetro, and we've tried to quantify or identify the resources. There are resources that are there. Whether, when we do more work and even say how much is available, whether we can mine that the shale as is in the US is a different matter because plenty of water is required. The environmental concerns are many and we, we are not sure of that. And most importantly, as I speak with you, everything about oil and gas is regulated by law. And the law in Nigeria today, even the PIB recognizes only gas and law, not, not shale gas. So legislation will be required, and that is not in the offing at all. So it's a long route to travel, mm -hmm. but the resources are there. Yeah, can I, can I uh, Mr. Moderator, um, complement that answer? Yes, we do have tar sands in the Ondo area and beyond. And um, Professor Quazo, in addition to the team, uh, Professor Mostos, uh, Most Onoha's team at the University of Nigeria, uh, Professor uh, Emeke Quazo, working out of uh, the, the, the University of Ibadan, has explored um, to a large extent the um, shell resources, shell gas, shell oil resources, particularly along the Lock Panther yeah. area in Ogo, close to Enugu. And uh, uh, Professor Noha knows that. Yeah. He has familiarity with that terrain. But the, we, in development, we talk about low hanging fruits. We go for those low hanging fruits. Uh, it's only when, you know, uh, things are getting tighter, you then go into high cost areas. For now, production of gas and oil from shell beds costs on the average, at least the US um, uh, prices that we know of, 40, 45 uh, dollars per, uh, per barrel to produce. And this is why when the oil price fell to below that production cost, most of the um, shell producers uh, <laughs> were forced to pack up and most of them, Played, um, you know, bankruptcies. Um, so, why go for high cost development when you have low cost? But it's always good as a nation to identify your resources. That's right. That's what we're doing. Yeah, for the harder days ahead. Yeah. And for now, we go 
uh, for the low hanging fruit. Thank you so much, um, Prof. So um, this, this one question is, is going to come from me. Um, now that I have uh, two professors on the call, well experienced, well accomplished, I, I want to ask, what is your view regarding um, uh, petroleum and gas training and education in Nigeria? Uh, regarding uh, the fact that everyone seems to be talking about, um, I mean, what you have already counted, Professor Ibe, that uh, we shouldn't be too much uh, worried about the fact that oil is going to go. Uh, but uh, in academic setting, it, it appears to me that people begin to run away from studying like petroleum engineering or even uh, natural gas. What will you, what will you be, what will be, your, what will, what will your opinion be regarding uh, the future of education in this area? This uh, question. Does my president, uh, uh, Professor Noha, does he want to go first? If not. Well, let me, I, I tell students in class, I am a visiting professor at uh, uh, AUST Abuja, in the petroleum engineering branch. And I always tell students, most of them are petroleum engineers that come from engineering backgrounds and so on, few from geology. And, um, the, the truth about it, and the DPR director said it, and Prof. Sibia had said it earlier in the day, don't worry about the futuristic things you see. The oil and gas industry is going to be around in the next 40 years. Which means for you young people, you can build your career. And we're going to make a lot more discoveries the energy demand and the conversion to so-called uh, the other energy sources that are cleaner and so on, yes, they are important and they will continue. But in the next 30 to 40 years, we're still going to need oil and gas. And at any rate, all we need to do is to develop what we have, as has been emphasized today. Somebody gave a very good example about coal. I have been an apostle of coal development. We have plenty of coal, good coal in Nasarawa State, in Kogi State, in Benue. And of course, where coal had earlier already been discovered in around Enugu. And even, I'm talking about good quality coal, not lignite, which is a poorer standard coal, which East Germany used in becoming a world power. And we have plenty of lignite. Nobody is doing anything. The key thing is, is sustainable development of these resources. Sustainable means we are not endangering future generations. In other words, if I'm building a coal power plant, I should first of all begin by making sure I don't pollute the environment. And the technologies are available today. So who is it that somewhere else is trying to tell you not to develop your coal resource? So we shouldn't bow to that. And I'm happy DPR director said that. So these are the thing, way to go. So for the industry, for us training geologists, geophysicists, petroleum engineers, mining engineers, they have work. They have work. And so the training is not affect the, the careers. And if you are good, you will make a career anywhere in your field, anywhere in the world. Yeah, proceed, uh -huh. please. Yes, I'd like to add to that by um, saying that this is the time to defy the naysayers and intensify our capacity building efforts in petroleum engineering, geology, and the associated fields. I can send you um, a moderator because you teach your, your head of department at um, the Petroleum Department at Blaze University. I can send you papers written in the 20s, 1920s, 1930s, predicting 20 years as the end uh, for the of use petroleum. of petroleum. Petroleum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about 1930s and a very well, you know, uh, uh, research papers. And here we are, you know, almost a century after, we're still sitting broadly. And to how I ended my lecture, I would repeat that 
everything, including the tables and chairs we sit on, you only need to look around. Whether it's the Airbus 380 or the Dreamliner, the bullet trains, the Ferrari and the Volkswagen, the lipstick, the toothbrush, you need to look at products from petroleum, very awe-inspiring. And which tells you that irrespective of the arguments, even if you go for decarbonization, using petroleum as feedstock for industries will keep that possibility alive. So when people, it depends how you frame the narrative. And that was why I ended on a very optimistic note that when people tell you diamonds are forever, tell them so is petroleum. And I have good reasons and authority to say that. Thank you so much, uh, Prof, for the assurance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, are, we are, haven't finished yet. Uh, questions will be, uh, we will reserve some questions to ask later. Uh, at this point, we, we want to invite um, the, the, the MC to take over the, um, the event, and then I'll come back later, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish. Uh, thank you so much for your time. MC, happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I want to say a very big thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you for the engaging and brain stimulating session. Let me quickly read some observations we have from the chat box from Galaxy Ace 8. Great presentations. We, are, we all agree that Nigeria has huge potentials to achieve energy security. We also agree that Potentials remain potentials until they are harnessed and put to efficient use. I am thrilled to also see the passion and all the innovations introduced to address the logistical challenges to harnessing our oil and gas potentials. We are again on the path to greatness as we plan a just energy transition. Professor. Tony and Young, thank you for that. We have several observations and thank you to everybody that have, have given a contribution and have stayed to the end of these um, presentations. Of course, I want to give a special shout out to the management of DPR, the head of public affairs and all of the management of DPR that have come out here to be part of this event. I really appreciate, of course, the CEO, and the commander in chief of DPR. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. <coughs> we also have some distinguished personalities that are joined in here. The SPE Lagos section J, in the person of Mr. Michael Oyere. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I believe a lot of members from Lagos section are also here. Thank you so much sir, for joining us. I also want to welcome and also um, recognize the presence of a man who prides an effective representation of SP Abuja section, a man I call a boss. He is the immediate past section chair, and of course, our section director, the one and only Mr. Ere Iyala. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, we will quickly move to um, our industry personality of the quarter. Just in case you don't know, the industry personality of the quarter was launched by SP Abuja section to recognize senior and professional members who have contributed immensely to the growth of SP and the industry. Last um, quarter, our recipient who won, um, who received the award was Professor Chuku Godwin who is the president and CEO of Tonsia Energy Consulting and Professional Services. So right about now, just before we call our webinar to a close, we will recognize the Tia Roba and the latest industry personality of this quarter. And to do that will be a man I love so much. He is the coordinator of this event. He's a student affairs chairperson, and of course, a lecturer in the Department of Petroleum and Gas Engineering, Nell University of Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with um, digital appreciation, help me welcome to take over 
and recognize our industry personality of the quarter, the one and only Ogene Rume Ogolo, Mr. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Akman, for that um, um, warm welcome. All protocols duly observed. Um, the time has come for us to present a very noble industry recognition to one of our own, someone, someone who has served at the highest capacity in SPE Nigeria Council. SPE Abuja section launched a program recently to recognize senior and professional members who have contributed greatly to the growth of the society and immensely to the industry. The program is tagged, as you can see, SPE Abuja section industry personality of the quarter. For the fourth quarter of the year 2020, engineer George Kalu was selected to receive this noble industry award from Abuja section as a result of his immense contribution to the society and to the industry. Permit me to read a brief biography of engineer George Kalu. Engineer George Kalu holds a BNG in petroleum engineering from the Federal University of Technology, Oweri, and a Master of Business Administration, MBA, in financial management from the Lagos State University, Ojo, Lagos. He is an alumnus mm -hmm. of United States International Visitor Leadership Program on US foreign policy and energy security. And Carlo is a past chairman of SPE Nigeria Council in the year 2016, member of SPE Nigeria Council Board of Trustees in the, from the year 2016 to date. He is the director of SPE section 199, 199 that is Abuja section, from 2013 to date, is a member of SPE International Committee on Section and Chapter Programs from 2014 to 2016. He has served as SPE Nigerian Council Technical um, Chair for NNPC from the year 2009, and is the S he was the SPE Abuja Section Chair from the year 2011 to 2013. Permit me to repeat again that he was the council chair for SPE Nigerian Council that is in the year 2009. He's a member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and currently is the national chairman of the Petroleum and Gas Division of NSC. He has led a team on behalf of SPE Nigerian Council to successfully um, launch the SPE uh, branch under the Nigerian Society of Engineers. So, Engineer George Carlo is a recipient of so many award, award, one of which is the Nigerian Distinguished Service Award in the year um, 2009, African Distinguished Service Award, which was given by SPI in the year 2010, and it was the best top performer of participants from 11 countries in refineries profitability workshop for future advanced petroleum technology costs of Japan compression Center Petroleum in Tokyo. So on this ground, I would like to invite Mrs. Wakia Sambo to present this Noble Industry Award to Engineer George Kalo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rume. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Permit me to stand on the already established protocol once again, I'd like to thank you very much for taking our valuable time to attend this very auspicious webinar. You must agree with me that it's been a day very well spent. So on behalf of the SP Abuja section and in my capacity as a section secretary, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to present to you our industry personality of the quarter, our very learned and erudite engineer, George Kalu. Please, I'd like you all to kindly free your hands and unmute your mics as we give him a resounding round of applause, please. A very big congratulations to you, Engineer George Carlu. The virtual space is yours for you to give us an acceptance speech. Engineer George Carlu. Uh, thank you very much. Um... The Publicity uh, Secretary, uh, Ms. Rekia Sambo, 
I feel honored uh, by SB Abuja section to, to be found uh, worthy of this award in as much as I know I'm unworthy. I gladly accept this award and uh, I will also dedicate it back to SP Abuja, uh, a section which we conceived from infancy and has grown to this particular level. We truly appreciate the section as it's growing. I want to commend uh, Aristotle, uh, John Emezi, the current chairman for the great strive we're having, and other directors, Eri Yala, Salahuddin, Tahir, and other members of the board of uh, Abuja section. I also want to congratulate and commend the Lagos section where I was chairman to, uh, 2008 of the Lagos section for also joining this uh, event. We truly appreciate uh, collaboration among the section. I will also, on behalf of SP Nigerian Council uh, Board, the Board of Trustee of SP Nigerian Council, gladly accept this offer and commend Abuja section for keeping the flag flying. Thank you and God bless, appreciate. Thank you very much, Engineer George Kalu. He's our SP Abuja section industry personality of the quarter, a very well deserved award for him. Thank you very much for being here. At this point, um, we've come to almost the formal end of today's webinar. And I'd like to humbly just hand over to the moderator, or the MC, sorry, um, hand over to the MC, Mr. Akpan, to finally draw the curtain on this event this afternoon. Thank you. Akpan, the floor is yours. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, once again, congratulations to Engineer George. Kalu. I have not seen digital appreciations in the comment section. I want to see your comments and your chats congratulating our latest, the tear rubber, all the way from SP Abuja section, our industry personality of the quarter. Can I see digital appreciations in the comment section? I'm watching, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, please. Just congratulate him. Let's see you, let's see you, let's see you, let's see you. Congratulate him, please. Congratulate him. Th congratulate him. We thank you. Congratulate him. I I'm reading. I'm reading. I'm waiting for to see your congratulations. Okay, Your Excellencies, uh, very distinguished, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, you've come to the end of this webinar. Okay, Usman Gabi, I see you. Rabiu, I see you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the recipient, thank you. Chiamaka, a well deserved award. Th thank you. From Michael Oyere, the, Oyere, the section chair, SPE Lagos section, super congratulations to you for the many accolades and strides within and beyond the industry. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you, sir. SPE Lagos section, thank you. Yetunde and Laidetan, thank you so much, ma'am. Congratulations. Petrus is there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we come to the very end of this Independence Day lecture. But of course, an event must come to an end with a closing remarks. So once again, please permit me to invite our latest recipient of the Abuja industry personality of the quarter, as he will give us a closing remarks. Remember, he was supposed to do the opening remarks, but we switched it with our council chair, so, uh, a section chair, sorry. So right now, please help me welcome engineer George Kalu for his closing remarks. Sir, the visual stage is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, observe protocol. I want to appreciate the Director, Department of Petroleum Resources, engineer Awalu Sarki for his presentation. Our eminent and erudite uh, professors, Professor Chidi Ibe, Professor Carlo Montus Onoha, for your wonderful lectures. And uh, uh, my remark has to do about the, uh, the issue that uh, Professor Ibe had mentioned on energy mapping for the next 50 years. What is our road, our roadmap towards that? It's important to look at it from that perspective because um, being alumnus of uh, US energy policy, uh, 
uh, foreign policy and energy security, there are a few things we need to draw and lessons for Nigeria. Uh, we don't have an energy policy. We've talked in part about the petroleum industry bill, which is part of a bigger energy policy. As part of our energy policy, we must also include our infrastructure, which has to do with our railways. Now we are building railways. Are we going to make them electric railways? Are we still going to depend on more fossil fuel? How do we move, just as uh, Professor Noah have talked about coal, how do we use advanced technology of uh, taking the coal, if we, they say it's not a green energy, how do we pulverize the coal and take it through steam and make it cleaner and generate the same energy? There are other issues of how to, how do we change our energy mix going forward? It's important we look at it. In our policy, do we have, and we need an energy policy and an act, which will go ahead and look at the infrastructure because yes, we are developing infrastructure, but there must be an act to, if we look at our past where we had to nationalize oil companies, the appetite for investment is still, people are looking at issues of security. So if you have an act and we they can, you know, have a recourse to, then they can look at developing the entire infrastructure of energy. What are the funding challenges that we have? Because right now uh, I served in the committee trying to raise funds for the refinery. And most time the only fund greenfield infrastructures, which are, but looking at fossil fuel, most times you don't get funding. So as Nigeria goes into upgrading its refinery for them to comply with a free six pack of 10 ppm per sulfur uh, for a petroleum product, we must also use that window for us to look at how to develop the entire infrastructure and go to the African Union, uh, which is currently has done a study, NMPC is part, uh, part sponsor of that study, so that we can get global funding from Afroexim Bank and other, other bodies to be able to fund our entire energy infrastructure. We may pass the PID bill, which, which is important we do, but then the entire energy infrastructure we have to look at. And we can improve our cost and meet our 10 dollar per barrel if we do more collaboration among the industry. The, the, the data mining which we currently have, um, which DPR is developing, is shared amongst, there's resource sharing, and we reduce our contract cycling time. We have community issues which also lead to HSC if we improve upon it. Uh, the impact of security is quite huge. We can also improve by doing inventory management and warehouse resourcing where we don't tie down our capital by keeping space for three years, which is cost to the industry. Um, I will also appreciate Professor Chidi Ibe for using my personal mantra in his speech, which is failure is not an option. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleague, thank you for attending this Independence Day um, a lecture series, and we truly appreciate. We must, as a people, focus at implementing renewable energy, gas to liquid, and if we can also promote energy efficiency of looking at the entire value chain, apart from petroleum, and improve our current energy demand of six gigawatt to where we should be to 30 gigawatts, then we'll actually be on the right path. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate that. Your Excellencies, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, we round up our Independence Day lecture. We really appreciate and we say thank you to everybody, the 35 participants who are still online right now. I believe a lot of people will need or will want to rewatch this video. We have the recorded version and of course we've got slides of from each of the presenters kindly go to the chat section and you will see a link there you can follow up the link drop your details and the video the recorded video and of course the slides we sent to you once again thank you so much for joining our today's event i remain off of Fonono Akpan, and i want to say thank you thank you thank you